back. This is lecture nine in our quantum field theory series. And today we're continuing with the quantization of a scalar field. So on the last lecture, we define what a scalar field is and, and we went through the canonical quantization of the scalar field. Uh, we, we, we defined the scalar field, we define its uh, conjugate momentum, and then we turn these two into operators by transforming uh, the Poisson brackets of the, the classical theory into commutator, commutation relations. Right? Then there was a lot of technical details on, on, on how to write these uh, operators now in the covariant way uh, or relativi uh, relativity uh, friendly way right and 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 put them in the best form possible for what we want to do next but beside these uh, uh, technical questions uh, the important um, results we got are actually these ones, right? So I could, in the end, get the field written in terms of creation and a, a creation and annihilation operators, right? And this is true only for the free scalar field. So we started as a general uh, a scalar field, but then I rapidly specialized to the free case, right? Which is the part of the Lagrangian that I wrote initially that only has the quadratic terms. There's basically a, a term with derivatives on the fields and a phi square term, which is the simplest thing we, we, we can do. And I, I have shown that in this case, we have something very similar to the harmonic oscillator. Does the creation and annihilation operators, which are the same thing as the ladder operators for a harmonic oscillator. I have also shown, and this is very important, that the Hamiltonian of the system can be written in terms of this created creation and annihilation operators, and that again looks very much like a harmonic oscillator, but now with a different frequency for each momentum. So I can vary um, momenta um, continuously, and, and that makes for an infinite collection of uh, harmonic oscillators right? and, and and that tells me that I have a discretized spectrum for each of these frequencies I have a discretized spectrum right which is composed of packets of energy EP right and I have also shown that if you define momenta as the quantity uh, conserved under spatial translations then you get this operator I remember that the fields and conjugate momentum are operators. And I have also shown that the spectra of momentum, right, uh, is also discrete, right? The same number of packets uh, will produce uh, energy EP and momentum P, right? Each of these packets uh, will produce uh, that amount of the energy and that amount of momentum. And this is important because these two quantities satisfy the rel relativistic uh, dispersion relation. And, and that means that this has a very good chance of being interpreted as a particle, uh, relativistic particle with mass m. And this m is a quantity that was in our Lagrangian from the start, but didn't need to be, right? Uh, I put it there like that because I knew where I was going. And it is in, very important to keep in mind that this identification is only valid for the free theory. We'll see what happens in the interacting theory later. Huh? And besides, I, I have also shown that if you take the, this, the same packets, right, when I act with a dagger of P in the vacuum, I get this state which I'm calling P. Right, it has a definite momentum, okay? and I project this state in this one, which is what I obtain when I when I act with the field, which has a well-defined position in time, right, on the vacuum. Right? I project P on that. I get something equivalent to a wave function again for this relativistic particle. It has a, a, a plane wave, which is what we would expect from from P, showing that we get something similar 
to what we we had in in quantum mechanics when you take a state of definite moment p and project on the space of definite uh, of the eigenvectors of position right and these are the the equivalent of the eigenvectors of pos position here because psi depends only on, on on x and t and it is composed of all all the states uh, in momentum right so that's what how far we got on the last lecture and as i promised we're going towards causality right the point here is to get um in a discussion of how causality works in these theories because uh, i still have to show that uh the, the quantum field theory deals with causality better than the uh relativistic quantum mechanics right that was one of the problems that i pointed out at the start of the course uh, in relation to the klein gordon and the dirac equation so we're going towards that but it's easier to see what happens if we generalize these a little bit right we're dealing here with a, a real scalar field right and, and it the situation is actually clearer with the complex scalar field so and then of course you can go back to the real one at any time just just by making the imaginary part zero right so uh, let's take a look at the, the at the complex scalar field before we go for uh, we go forward uh, it's important to to that uh, you have done the exercises of lectures seven and eight because I'll use, I use, I have exercises about the complex scalar field there, and I use some results that you have shown in those exercises here. So if you didn't, that's a good point to stop and go take a look at those exercises before we go forward. Let's start with the Lagrangian for this uh, complex scalar field. Right? As before, I'm writing a fairly general uh, form with the caveat that, of course, these coefficients that go in front are not the most general thing you could think of, right? In fact, I want people to notice that I had a factor one half for the real scalar field, and now I, I don't have that factor one half. Keep that in mind. Eventually, you'll see the motivation behind it. But again, I'm doing this for convenience and this is what is appropriate for the identifications i i will make later right so i don't have to just keep some general coefficient here and in the end identify those coefficients which with what i have already written right again i have a potential right which now needs to be a function of phi modulus phi square because the lagrangian is real Right, so I'm writing all terms that keep the Lagrangian real and satisfy uh, same conditions I had for the scalar field before. Right, I'm not putting odd terms in the field because they would be complex and because it would create a Lagrangian that is unbounded from below and so on and so forth. This uh, potential I'm keeping here for now, but we'll really take it to be zero in what follows because we we prefer to deal with the free scalar field for now complex or not right? so the main difference that arises when i put a complex scalar field is that is that now i have a additional symmetry here that i didn't have with the with the real scalar field which is that at least this lagrangian is symmetric under the a change of phase of the field, right? Since the field is now a complex number, right? Alpha is just any phase, right? And and it's not a function of x, so alpha is just a number, really, a real number. And um, you can easily see, right? If I put that here, these exponentials just go away because I always have the complex conjugate everywhere. And, and the Lagrangian does, doesn't change at all, right? And this is a continuous symmetry because alpha can be as small as I want. These transformations form a group 
which is called the U1 Global uh, Global U1 Group, right? And those of you familiar with group theory already know this, but this is, is simple, right? U is for unitary, one is uh, for one by one, so this is the group of all unitary one by one matrices, which is just complex number of uh, unit length, right? And global refers to the fact that this this alpha does not depend on position. Otherwise, it would be a local U1 because it, the parameter here would depend on the position. We will see about local theories later, or local symmetries later. For now, what what this theory has is just this global. U1 symmetry. And there's many ways that we can refer to this field now, right? That it transforms under, under these transformations of the U1 group. Uh, we usually say that uh, um, that phi transforms under global U1, right? Or and many times you, you hear also that uh, uh, phi is charged under U1. This charge is related to the fact that since this is a continuous symmetry, there will be some conserved quantity here, right? Which is the charge. But we'll, we'll get to that uh, as we go, right? And just defining the vocabulary here. As far as um, uh, movement equations for this uh, field, if you go to take this as a classical field and, and 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 figure out i mean take the principle of stream action and figure out the movement equations right you get that uh, the field phi satisfies this movement equation i mean if you take the variation in relation to phi you see the phi star satisfies this movement equation And if you vary the action in relation to phi star, then you get this equation of movement, classical, right? So both uh, phi and phi star satisfy uh, Klein-Gordon equations, right? In the case of u equal to zero, right? And in the case u is different from zero, they mix with each other by these uh, by these terms, which depend, of course, on exactly what form uh, the the potential has. It's important to notice here that since now we're dealing with a complex field, there are two different numbers that I need to specify the field at every point in space-time. Right? And in the language of a field theory, we say this, these are two different degrees of freedom, right? It's, it's, it becomes fairly obvious if I just uh, write phi in terms of the real part plus the, the, the imaginary part, right? And you see that in the free case, the, this decouples in two, two uh, Lagrangians. So it's, but, but it is much more convenient. Instead of t treating the real part of phi and the imaginary part of phi as these two independent degrees of freedom, it's easier to work with phi and phi star as two different degrees of freedom. It's the same thing, right? Because, of course, and it's just a, a different basis. So that's how, how we'll proceed by looking at these as two independent fields, phi and phi star. Uh, then what, what we need to do here, I'm, I'm not going through every step because uh, that would be too repetitive. It, everything is very similar to the uh, real field. Uh, so the next step is to take u, the potential, equal to zero and look at the free field, which again looks a lot like a uh, harmonic oscillator, right? These two equations for phi and phi star are exactly the same equations uh, the real field satisfied uh, before. Right? It's just Klein-Gordon. So again, I can go to mom uh, momentum space and uh, recognize a harmonic oscillator there and write phi and phi star in terms of um, creation and annihilation operators. 
But it is important to see that these are two equations. So if I'm writing phi and phi star in terms of A and A daggers, I actually need two sets of A daggers and A's. Some places you see this called A and A dagger, and B and B dagger. That is not exactly the, the, the notation we use here, but it is important to see that I actually have two creation operators and two annihilation operators, given the fact that I have two degrees of freedom. So I have two fields and two conjugate momentum. And more than that, I need one field to be the complex conjugate of the other. And that means that when I go to operators, I'll have phi and phi dagger, and they need to be uh, the Hermitian conjugates of each other. Uh, uh, and in that case, the only way of obtaining that is this one. Right, so I'll now just write phi and phi dagger in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So this is very similar to what I have up here. Right, I want to write something equivalent to that, but now I have a a dagger and another set of a and a dagger. So. This part is just the usual thing because I have to go to momentum space to write it. 1 over square of 2 EP or omega P, it doesn't matter. right? Again, EP or omega P will be obtained from the Klein Gordon equation, so it's the same as before, satisfying the relativistic dispersion relation. And here, co here, here comes the, the tricky part, right? So I have, instead of calling A and B, I will call it A plus and A minus, right? So these are the two sets of creation products. So I have A plus P T exponential of I P X plus and here you could imagine they will just put a plus dagger, right? But that's not what I'll do. And soon will become clear. I put a minus dagger. So this is coming from the other set of creation operators. T. And this is just what you would expect to be here from the solutions uh, of the klein gordon equation. And then I will write phi dagger of x and t. And this I can just repeat. It's the same. And here's the important part. This is a plus dagger. Minus, right? And this is a minus times this exponential. Right? So the name of the creation and oper uh, annihilation operators is, is not important. I just call this. Uh, set of creation and annihilation M a, a, a plus and this is a dagger now I have to to make a proper dagger as to not be confused with the plus <laughs> so this is a plus dagger and a plus a minus dagger and then a minus right and and the name is not important the important thing to notice here is that I, I cannot put this uh, set of creation and annihilation on the same field because when I take dagger of phi this guy will, will be taken here right it will mix right so if I want this to be the Hermitian conjugate of this right the operators uh, will, will be mixed here I have a plus plus a minus and, and the opposite here right even if I started just calling this a plus Right? It will end up down there when I take the the 
the complex conjugate. So it is important to 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 see that when I want to write my theory in terms of phi and phi dagger, phi actually has the creation operator of one of the sets and the annihilation from the other set and vice versa. Right? That that cannot be avoided if you want these two to be a complex conjugate of each other. So that's the important part that you need to notice here. And also, again, that you have two sets of creation and annihilation operators for this uh, to work, or for a complex uh, uh, field. This is just the most general solution. I can do the same for the uh, conjugate momenta of the fields. I just write it here, but it's again, you just just take those and 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 I mean it's the same thing I did for the scalar field. I'll do it quickly here. Yeah, I'm using EP, so let me put EP here. A minus P T exponential P X minus A plus dagger P T exponential minus E P X and the same for the pi dagger d3p 2p to the cube i square root of ep over 2 a minus dagger p t Exponential of minus e p times x minus a plus p t exponential of i p x. Right, so this is completely analogous to the real field, but now, as I said, I have these uh, two sets of creation and annihilation operators. Hmm? And if you then take the commutation uh, relations between um, phi's and pi's and, and write these in terms of A and A dagger, then you see that really with the names I use here, you actually have one commutation for A plus Pt. Uh, let me suppress this. Right. I, I, no, let me write because uh, it's important to have the momentum. A plus p prime t. So I, I'm again doing equal time commutation relations for the same reason I did before. This is two pi to the cube direct out of p minus p prime and another one for the minus so it's plus plus minus minus right? which with with and and here you see that by using this uh, convention really the re, the cr creation and annihilation pair is really plus plus so whatever plus creates uh, uh, plus dagger creates plus will annihilate and, and same for the minus, right? So you see that the, the commutation relations really make plus plus a pair and not plus minus. That's important too, right? It justifies the names I'm, I'm giving to them. And any other commutator is zero. So if I take A plus with A minus is zero, A plus dagger with A minus is zero, uh, 
a plus dagger or a plus dagger is zero, the only one that is really not zero are a plus, a plus dagger and a minus, a minus dagger, right? Which sets uh, the, the relation between creation and annihilation, right? So, um, if you then use this and write, this is what was in the exercise, right? If you take this U global U1 symmetry and use Nether's theorem, you can show that there is a conserved uh, charge in this theory, quantity that we call charge, right? Uh, and that can actually be written in terms of these guys as in this the momentum space, right? As a plus of k dagger a plus k minus a minus dagger k a minus of k right? so see how there's no cross terms between plus plus minus minus is, is so that you actually have and this is already all operators Right? From this point down, I made everyone an operator. So this is an operator, 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 and I have the quantum version of the theory. And this is the number plus operator with momentum k. And this is the number minus operator with momentum k. So now instead of have one collection of excitations uh, or particles, I mean, by now you're convinced, not convinced, but at least accepting the fact that I'll be treating these excitations as particles. Uh, I'll have one set of particles that is created by this pair of uh, creation and annihilation, and this is the number of these particles in a given state. So if I apply this to a given state, I'm measuring the number of these plus particles, and this is measuring the number of these minus particles. And you can see that the total charge will depend on that. So uh, these uh, particles have negative of this kind of charge, because if I have a a hundred of these excitations, the total charge will be minus 100. And these guys, guys are positive in the sense that if I have a hundred of these, this conserved charge, this is the U1 conserved charge, right, will be a hundred. And if I have a hundred of these and a hundred of these, the total charge is zero. So they have opposite charge and, and the total number, the total charge of the system is given by the net charge of adding these two sets of completely independent excitations, right? And, and that also tells me a lot about these A's and A daggers, right? What, what I'm telling here is that A dagger plus, and, then, and now I'm justifying the notation plus here, right? Uh, creates a plus charge, right? Increases the charge of the state by one. While A plus without a dagger, right? Destroys charge plus, right? Annihilates charge plus. And it is the opposite with A minus dagger that creates minus charge and a minus that destroys a minus charge, annihilates a minus charge. If you look at the field, then the phi, right? Phi actually has um, a plus and a minus dagger. So it either destroys positive charge or creates negative charge. So in any way, right, it, it will either destroy 
positive charge or create so that in any way it increases uh, or decreases, sorry, it decreases Q by one, right? In any way, and 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 a similar thing is true by um, for uh, phi dagger because it, this one either destroys negative charge or creates positive, so in any way it increases charge by one. So this is the effect of the field. Looking at this, you see that now there is uh, at least two different one-particle states, right? For for the same momenta, I, I can define a, mom, a, a, a state with momenta p and charge plus, and this guy will be proportional to a plus dagger acting on the vacuum. Right? This is increasing the number of n n plus, right? and there's another one particle state that is the obtained by acting a, a minus dagger on the vacuum, which generates a state that has n minus equal to one. So this is increasing positive charge. This is increasing negative charge. So there are two different states right and this is how the the concept of antiparticles uh, springs up in in quantum field theory right this is much more beautiful than i think the the Dirac c right because now you see that particle and antiparticle keep in mind both have the same omega p right which is the square root of p square plus m square so they both satisfy the same dispersion relation for the same mass right because they satisfy essentially the same klein gordon equation as i have shown up here right so they have the same mass and uh, but they have opposite charges for now, just this charge, because this theory only has this symmetry. Where we'll see that when I put more symmetries in, every internal symmetry, like this one, will result on a different charge. And these guys will have opposite everything. Uh, all the charge will be opposite between the particle and antiparticle. Right? And, 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 and um, the, um, the, the nice part here is that they are both excitations of the same field. They don't exist independently. This field has more than one way of being excited, more than one direction, right? If you think that this is a, co a field which is composite of two degrees of freedom, right? the real part and the imaginary part of phi, there are more than one way of increasing the field, more than one direction, right? we decide to parameterize in terms of phi and phi dagger and these are the two ways of increasing the field one that results in an excitation with a plus charge and one that results in an excitation that carries a minus charge so this is the idea of antiparticles in quantum field theory right and they are two sides of the same coin two excitations of the same field Right, and, and and this is uh, it's quite nice, right? It's also a prediction of quantum field theory that there should be antiparticles. Okay. And what about momentum and, and and Hamiltonian? Right, the way to proceed with momentum and energy would be a, go back to Nether's theorem, take the stress energy tensor, and look what's conserved. Same thing we did with the scalar. Uh, field and then substitute phi's and pi's by this uh, um, expression written in terms of a plus dagger and minus dagger and so on and so forth, right? And you get uh, these two expressions, which again are what you would expect, but they are very 
uh, nice to look at because for momenta you have the number operator of plus particles plus the number operator of minus particles. So again, these behave just like particles, so it doesn't matter the charge. Right? Whatever is the charge, the number of charge minus particle plus the number of char uh, uh, um, um, the number of charge plus particles will result in the total number of particles each particle carrying momentum k. Right? So you just add up the momentum of every particle. And the same goes for energy. So the Hamiltonian will be just the integral in momentum omega k n plus k plus n minus k. So both energy and this is already the normal ordered Hamiltonian, right? Same for momentum. So both uh, um, energy and momentum are, are are defined in the way you would expect, and energy is positive definite, as you would expect. So no negative energies, but you have antiparticles. So you didn't you didn't need the antiparticles to fix negative energy because there's no negative energy, but they are there anyway, right? And they arise naturally from the fact that there is a conserved charge and and. And then the, the scalar, why did we go to these um, um, complex scalar field? Because the, the real scalar field now can be seen as a particular case of this, because if you take the particle to be its own antiparticle, right, then you fall back to the, the, the scalar case. You ha just have to... to make a plus, a plus equal to a minus, right? And then you you rewrite everything in the same way you had for the real scalar, with the exception of a factor 2 that will show up everywhere, right? This will be equal to this, this will be equal to this, so there will be a factor 2 everywhere. And that's the factor 2 I started with in the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian for the scalar field had a 1 half at the start. Right, so you get all the same results with, with the exception of factor two, and that's why I started with a little bit different Lagrangian. Uh, so in, to get really the scalar field with that Lagrangian, uh, I would have to divide everything by two at the end. Right? So, um, and of course, in that case, charge is zero, always which shows us that the scalar field is appropriate to describe scalar particles without charge, and uh, the, the complex one is, is appropriate to describe particles that have a charge compatible with a U1 charge, just a, a simple number. Let's move now to the question of uh, causality. So, if you remember well, the way we did uh, look into causality. In the case of relativistic quantum mechanics was to calculate the transition amplitude from uh, uh, one particle state at position Q at time t into another one particle state at position Q prime at time t prime. And, and, and we have seen that even when these uh, position and time were outside the future light cone of this one, then this was not zero, right? And But this was quantum mechanics, right? As we have indicated, now we want the quantum field theory counterpart of this calculation, right? Uh, as we have seen last time, the closest thing that we have to an eigenstate of position now is actually the field acting on uh, at some right the field is calculated at some point in space time this is the operator right acting on the vacuum so this is what passes as a uh, um, uh, definite position state right uh, with the caveat that we have no 
position operator. So this is not eigenvector of position operator because there is no position operator right, for a field. But this is uh, what is interpreted as a creation as a part of a particle at position zero because of course we have an a dagger inside here that will make a one particle state which is uh, appearing at this position and then we can now that we have the complex field take the uh, complex conjugate of that the Hermitian conjugate of that at a different position x Right? And this is a four position, so there's timings inside there too. And try, try to calculate this and see how causality behaves. This is the closest analog that we have to this object. Although you must keep in mind that it is not the same, because this was a one particle theory, right? So the particle started at this position, and whatever you see there must be the same particle. Now, we are in a theory where the number of particles is not exactly set, right? And we really what we're doing is measuring the field at position Y and then measuring uh, uh, the field at position X and see if there's an excitation there or not. But keep that in mind and let's move forward with the calculation, right? So, of course, now just to be sure, I'm defining x mu s uh, tx x, right? And, and y mu s ty y, right? Just to set the notation. And these are the four, um, uh, the four positions. Right? Uh, for simplicity, for now, let's go back to the scalar, the real scalar field. So psi dagger is equal to psi, and calculate this object. Zero. This is uh, proportional minus a lot of. The, uh, there's a lot of uh, when I write these guys in terms of integrals, there's the integrals in momenta, there's one over square root of two energy and whatnot, but I'm only really interested in the in the operator part of it. And that looks like this, right? So there's another a lot of integrals and other constants outside here. But I'm ignoring them, that's why I'm not using an equal here. And this uh, is A of P exponential of minus ipx plus a dagger of p exponential of ipx times a of q exponential of minus iq y iq y and a dagger of q exponential of plus I, Q, Y. So, see, I'm only interested in an A and A dagger parts. I'm ignoring all the integrals that should be out here. Right? We know that A dagger acting to the left on the vacuum is zero. So this part goes away. And the same is true for the annihilation operators acting to the right on zero, right? Because A zero is zero. Mm -hmm. And so we left only with this product of this part times this one, which is zero AP A dagger Q zero exponential of minus ipx plus iqy and this uh, i can use the um, commutation relation between a and a dagger to write in terms of the commutator right so i know the a a dagger is the commutator plus the other uh, ordering, but this is zero between these because this guy acting to the right on the vacuum is zero, 
and a dagger acting to the left on this vacuum is also zero. So inside this bracket between the vacuums, I can actually exchange a, a dagger by the commutator. And the commutator itself is actually a function, right? It's not, uh, it's not an operator anymore. The commutator is just 2 pi cube and the Dirac delta of P, P minus Q, right? Which can be taken out of the bracket, right? And then the normalization of uh, the vacuum is 1. So this whole thing will be just 2 pi cube Dirac delta P minus Q exponential of minus I P X plus I Q Y. Right? Of course, there's a lot of integrals in the front here. And now I want to write the full thing. So now it, it's really the whole expression. I have a d3p over 2 pi to the cube, 1 over square root of 2ep. This one is d3q over 2 pi cube, 1 over square root of 2 E Q and now I, I'm, I'm putting this part uh, here, right? Just copy this guy over here. Hmm? There's some uh, convenient cancellations there. I can make one of the integrals now, right? This will just, when I use this uh, Dirac delta P will be the same as Q. That means those two energies become the same, right? And I can write this just as the integral. Let's say I do the integral in Q. D3P, 2 pi cube, that comes from here, 1 over 2 E P and this exponential of P and Q are the same. I can put this uh, outside and see 1 P X minus Y and remember that P0 is E P right because we already had uh, P0 equal E P here and Q0 equal E Q Q0 equal EQ here, right? So I'm getting uh, this expression, and this guy has a name. We usually write, call this the D of X minus Y, which is defined as this object, which we have shown is equal to this uh, expression right here. Right? That's what, what we were looking for. So this function, of course, depends on the space-time coordinates here and here, and we can now see what's happen, what happens inside the light cone or outside the light cone uh, uh, to, to try to, dis to use it to discuss, discuss causality. We have to look at the separation here between, between these two space-time points. And in the case of um, the metric we're using here, which is uh, plus, minus, 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 right? We, uh, any separation in space-time can be written as uh, these, right? Delta T square minus delta x uh, square, right? And, and, and that means that if this is positive, I'm inside the light cone and the separation is um, time-like, and, and if, I, if this is negative, then I'm outside the light cone. Same will be true for this difference here. So 
what I have here is that if um, x minus y will be time-like if this uh, is positive and then I'm inside light cone and, 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 and the opposite is true, right? If this is negative, I'm uh, in a space-like uh, distance. Uh, let's tackle first the 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 first um, case just to see how this function looks right what really matters for causality is the second uh, case right? so in this case right I, I am if I draw a space time diagram here this is delta x I mean it's one of the directions but it doesn't matter uh, this is delta t, right? And let me put the forbidden light cone like that. So this is the light cone. Let's hope it's actually on the diagonal, All right? For case one, I'm somewhere here, so I'm inside. I'm inside the light cone, right? Because this. Uh, x minus y, minus y squared is bigger than zero and, and that means that I can do a, a boost to rotate uh, the coordinate system right to go over that point right I can go to a referential well Delta T prime comes here. And that means delta x is zero, right? It can always do that if um, the distance is uh, time-like. That means uh, t delta t prime. I can go to a referential where t is equal to t x minus t y, right? It's just a distance in time, but more importantly, x minus y is zero. Right, I went to a referential where delta x is zero because I can do this rotation. The only thing I cannot do is cross the red lines, right? Uh, and so, and then it's it's easy to do this integral, right? Because uh, I can actually go to spherical coordinates on on the three momentum and exchange d three p by d omega, which is the solid angle p square dp p is now just the modulus of vector p and then uh, this is a common trick that's why it's worth to go over it uh, i can take d dp remembering that uh, p is equal to square root of e square minus m square right then d dp will just be p over square root of p square plus m square which means that p dp let me put a d here p dp p square m square over square root of p square m square is d e and what's more important than p square d p over square root of p square plus m square is equal to I, I i added an extra power of p here right that's why p square and i'll add an extra power of p on this side so square root of e square minus m square d e this is a very useful expression because it allows me to exchange integrals in p squared dp by integrals in the energy. And then, let me bring, this is the expression I'm trying to calculate. To calculate this, I can now do the integral in the solid angle nothing depends on the angle inside so this will be just a 4 pi right have this integral in p square dp over 2 pi cube 
now I have this part, right? 1 over 2 EP, which again can be just written as this here, right? Square root of P square plus M square. So I can, now I have exactly what I need to do the integral in the energy if I want. And you know, on the top of the exponential, right, since the vector, the position is the same in this new referential I am in, right, I have only the time part, which is minus e i e p t, right? t is just the distance between tx and ty. So this integral now becomes um, 1 over 4 pi square. I'm taking all powers of pi that matter here. Um, and yeah, there's a constellation between 4 pi and this, this guy, right? And uh, I, I make the change of variables. Right? Now, this is just uh, the modulus of momenta, so it was going from 0 to infinity. That now becomes when momenta is 0, energy is just m to infinity. Mm -hmm. The integral in the energy times this e square minus m square exponential minus i e t. And now this is the answer, right? I would have to do this integral, but this again, I'm only really worried about big times. I mean, I have the answer here, but for big times, right? Then I can use the stationary phase uh, method or saddle point approximation, whatever you want to call it, and rewrite this as just it's dominated by the lower bound of the integral when this is oscillating less, right? If you go away from M, this starts oscillating faster and faster and faster, and, and, uh, and of course, it conceals out, right? So this is dominated by the exponential, the lower bound, when the, uh, the energy is M, right? Which... Uh, the dominating factor here, right? So this this goes as the exponential of this uh, to um, to big time, right? So that means we're staying the same point, and there's an oscillation of probability of finding the particle still there after a big time or not, right? This is just how this function looks for big times. Now let's look at the second case, right? Which is the one that actually matters uh, for causality. Hmm. So now I am in a space-like distance between the two points. That means I can rotate again, right? Now I am on this side and I can rotate, but now to make the time interval zero, right? So now I can go to a referential where uh, tx is equal to ty, right? But I cannot make the distance zero. And I call the distance just r. And, and, and then I, I'll try to solve um, the integral again. So dx minus y in this case, again, is just the integral in three momenta, 2 pi cube, 1 over 2 ep. And now the time part of this exponential goes away. I'm left only with three momenta and, and, and the three positions because I made uh, the two times the same. Right. Again, I go to um, spherical coordinates, but now 
I have a dependency on one of the angles here. Right? This depends on the cosine between uh, momenta and n position. So I have this part, which is uh, phi here is, is the angle, right? The angle nothing depends on. So this is just 2 pi. But I have still the integral in momenta. This one goes from 0 to infinity. And I have the integral in the angle between P and R, right? Which I'll write in terms of the, the integral of the cosine of that angle. That's easy to do, right? And so I end with I P R cosine of theta. Right? So this is uh, what I can do to break down this integral into three integrals, right? The, the only easy one is already done. Now, this integral, once I write in terms of the d cosine of theta, it becomes a easy to do. This will be just 2 pi, that comes from here. The integral in momenta, which I'm left in, leaving, for, leaving for last, dp to e p 2 pi cube. Um, and this, of course, I just have to take this exponential of both at both limits, right? Uh, is I P R minus E to the minus I P R over I P R, right? This is the result of this integration, which I did in the spherical coordinates. Now, on this part, notice that I can separate these integrals into two, but uh, if I do p going to minus p, take the second integral here, which looks like this. Let me write explicitly. So let me copy this. I have a minus, that is this one, exponential of i p r over i p r. Right? You have another integral that takes this exponential minus this one. But this one, this one, I can I can I can do a little trick here, which is making taking p to minus p. And when I do that, this limit will become will become minus infinity. This exponential changes sign. Right, and here I have uh, I can I um, conceal this p with the p square here, right? So there's only powers of p here, and there's a sign coming from this p, a sign coming coming from this one. So there's no net sign here, right? And of course, e p does not change. So this is what happens, right? And and in the end, I I can also take minus infinity down here. And that actually changes this sign. So I can put this integral together with the one that comes from the other exponential. Right now it's the same exponential, and and do this integral from minus infinity to infinity. So in a little trick, I can I can just disappear with this part here, and make this from minus infinity to plus infinity. Right. So I'll do that. And, and, and moreover, I have to, to just uh, simplify all powers here. So, uh, as I said, um, as I said, uh, p goes away here. There's a p square constellation. Um, the factors of 2 pi I'll actually I'll, I'll only make a square here. And there's a factor 2. And when we take all of this, this i I'll bring outside that's minus i. There's a 2 pi square here. There's a 2 r outside, right? Because this integration in momentum, the distance can go outside. As I said, the integral is now from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
p d p right p square went away right and there's the exponential over energy there's an ep here they'll write that i'll write uh, as uh, p square plus m square okay and then i have to do this integral this is done by residues right uh, so there are a few poles here right when p is equal to plus or minus i mass right the poles are not in the path of integration but it's very convenient to uh, use them to find the answer to this integral right we have to look at the complex plane for p So this is the real part of P, where we're doing the integral along this axis. This is the imaginary part of P. And here are the poles, right? We have a pole at uh, plus the mass and at minus the mass, right? And now we, we need to decide on the on the path of integration, the integration we're really interested in is along this axis, but we need to close it on the top or the bottom, right? Since this is the exponential that will determine uh, uh, what is the best option, we have to look at it, and, and, and you see that if the imaginary part of P is positive, what happens is that the exponential of i p r will be the exponential of i real part of p r times the exponential of minus the imaginary part of p r and this goes to zero if the imaginary part is positive because then this exponential kills uh, the integral on the upper part of the complex plane. And that's why we're closing this up here, right? So imagine a semicircle that actually closes this from the top and the integral over this semicircle will be zero because the imaginary part of P is always positive on the upper plane. So when I take R to infinity, right, or P, sorry, the, imaginary part of p to infinity then i'm 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 uh, closing the deal here hmm? um, and 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 of course this is by residues i just take this pole and write the answer to the integral All right so d x minus y will be just 2 pi i which is coming from the residues and and uh, inside I have minus i over 2 pi square 2r, which is all these things out here, times the part, inner part of the integral by making p equal to the residue. And this is the exponential of the minus mr. Right, I do a little bit of simplification there and I get i m over 4 pi r um, times the exponential of minus m r which of course falls as an exponential for big r right as r goes to infinity this is exponential decay but it's not zero so again, we have a non-zero no, non probability, right? It is, uh, this is the amplitude, right? So we take the modulus square, square of that to make this a uh, real number, but the exponential stay, right? And uh, seems like we are violating causality again, right? Now, this needs careful consideration, right? Because 
it is the whole logic is based on an analogy I made at the start, which is saying that calculating this in quantum field theory amounts to the same as calculating this in, qu in, in quantum mechanics. And apparently, in fact, it, it is not, right? The main difference is that in here, we don't have the particle as the uh, fundamental degree of freedom. The fundamental degree of freedom is the field, right? And I cannot even guarantee that whatever I'm measuring at x is the same particle that started at y. There's no, uh, there's no way of being sure of that. All, all, all I'm doing is measuring some excitation of the field in different uh, points in space-time. Right, so we may be asking the wrong question when we do this calculation. Right, the, the reason we did is because we need the results. Right, I'm not do, just wasting your time. Right, we we use this object a lot. Right, but but it is it's not telling us the full story. Right, what I want to convince you is that in this case the good question to ask would be about a different object, which is the following. Say I'm considering the commutator between the field operator at point X, space-time, right? So this is four position, and the, the operator at time Y, right? And let's think of two possibilities. This is either zero or not. Right? In quantum mechanics, what are the implications of, of these two uh, uh, possibilities? Right? When the commutator between two operators, and, and here let's, let's consider an operator at x and an operator at y as, as different operators. Right? We know, for instance, that the commutator between position and momentum in quantum mechanics is not zero. And that means that measuring position changes momenta, and measuring momenta changes position. I mean, I cannot know both uh, with infinite um, precision because the very act of measuring causes problems with the other uh, operator. Now, when, when you take two different operators and the commutator is zero, that means I can measure this guy and this guy as well as, as my experiment allows. There's no uncertainty principle uh, between them which means measurements in operator 1 will not influence measurements in operator 2, right? And, and that's, that's the real question that I, I propose we should measure, we should ask here, right? So if these, these two positions are separated in a space-like way, I mean, they are outside the light cone, of each other, then maybe the commutator between them should be zero. Because then, whatever I measure at y cannot influence whatever I measure at x. Right? And despite I ha having this amplitude between them that is, is different from zero, I, I, one measurement cannot influence the other. And it, in, on the other side, inside the light cone, Whatever I measured at y can influence, since I'm assuming y happens before x, right? can influence what happens at x later. So the commutator between measuring something at y has to influence what I measure at x. So the commutator of, between them must be different from zero.
So let's let's take a look at this and see if these two things are true. And this is what I'll call causality for now. Right? This can this is 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 one way of thinking about it, but it, it can be made better. Right? Later we'll define observables of the theory. And then um, we'll see that the all the observables are actually written in terms of co these commutators and not just products of the fields. And then we see that also the theory is causal because of that, because the observables will be written in, term of, in terms of the commutators. But even without that, I hope that the logic here is clear, that causality is really guaranteed by the fact that if these commutators are zero, the measurements cannot influence each other. So let's calculate the commutator and see, uh, you see what happens. And notice that now we're calculating um, commutators between different times, right? Because before, when, when I quantize this uh, theory, um, we defined the theory, we actually did the quantization by defining equal time commutation relations, right? We define uh, commutation relations between um, different points, but the same time, right? And this we know is zero, so that's the trivial one, right? If the time is the same, it's zero because that comes from the very conditions we use to quantize uh, this theory. Uh, now we're considering, a, uh, as I promised when we did those uh, commutation relations, now we're doing it from for, for different times. So le let me do this. So uh, I'll just write both uh, phi of x and phi of y in terms of the, their creation and annihilation operators. So I have an integral in momenta for uh, the first field, another integral for the second one, and then the commutator between the parts that are actually operators, right? which is A, B exponential of i p x plus a dagger p exponential of minus i p x um, oops this is the first field and the second one is um, a of q exponential minus i q y plus a dagger q exponential of i q y okay Right? Okay, so this actually, I, I got the signs wrong here. So this is minus and this is plus. Okay, so now I have to to work out all these commutators, right? And uh, of course, the commutator of A with A is zero, independent of the momentum, uh, and same A dagger with A dagger, so I only have the cross terms here and they these are easy to obtain so what I have basically just two terms coming out of this commutator one is proportional to the exponential of minus i p x plus i q y so this part commuting with this one so I have the commutator of a p with a dagger q and I have another part that is these two commuting is just exponential of plus i 
px minus iqy commutator of a dagger p with a q right and this is uh, just uh, 2 pi cube Dirac delta of p minus q and this is minus 2 pi cube Dirac delta of p minus q right so same delta and I can use that to to integrate right if I do that these energies become the same this 2 pi cube goes away with the 2 pi cube here I have to be careful with this relative sign between these two exponentials but everything else gets really simple I'm missing a factor 2 here this becomes just the integral d3p over 2 pi cube 1 over 2 ep because I can put these two together right and exponentials so the first one is this it's just exponential minus i p p and q are the same now so it's just x minus y minus right this minus here the second exponential which is just minus i p y minus x right just because the sign is the opposite here right and so I just took that into the distance which if you look at that thing we calculated before is exactly the same right so this uh, expression right here you see so what I'm getting down there is just that object that I said I was not calculating but just because I'm dumb right? is the x minus y minus d y minus x right? so this is what I, I, I get and of course remember a commutator is just a function you see it's not an operator all the operators went away as I, I wrote them as commutation relations right? that means I also can calculate this right? which is important because that's what you usually calculate in quantum mechanics right? the transition between states and this is the same as the commutator times this right which is one and so the same result follows right so I can write transitions also uh, will will be the same right between states now let's think about time-like and uh, uh, space-like separation for space-like separation uh, there's two things I can can do right the first is that of course we can make the time separation zero and make it just a, a spatial separation right this is just a Lorentz transformation and I make the time difference zero another thing we can do is that I can rotate this to make uh, x minus y to be equal to minus x minus y this is another Lorentz rotation right because if you think this is the equivalent of doing this rotation right here right I just I'm not crossing the light cone I'm just uh, taking delta x to minus delta x all the way over here and these all rotations in time and space are allowed and are part of the the Lorentz group as long as I don't cross I cannot make a time uh, like separation into a space like and vice versa right but I can rotate here 
Well, so these, uh, let me put these over there, right? These kind of rotation would be forbidden, right? That, that I cannot do. So I can take uh, these to minus this. The thing is that here I, I bring back the definition of these, these is that they are uh, invariant under Lorentz transformations. Remember, I proved on the last lecture that this kind of integral is the invariant integral, and this is just a Lorentz scalar up here. And that means if I can make that uh, a change, right, this change will imply that the x minus y four time uh, four space like separation is equal to d of y minus x yeah? and so these two terms uh, conceal each other and as i wanted right the commutator for space like separations will be zero right which is perfect what about time uh, like separations right so this is for space like right now for time like this is not so simple right because x minus y can now be written as t x minus ty t uh, y zero because now I can make the space separation go to zero by a Lorentz transformation and y minus x can be written as t y minus t x zero but now as I said before this rotation that inverts the sign of time takes delta t into minus delta t, cannot be made without crossing the light cone. So I cannot make dx minus y equal to dy minus x. There's no Lorentz transformation that does that. right? And that means that in this case, with uh, x minus y square bigger than 0, right, it's the opposite of the previous case, d x minus y is not the same as this y minus x. And thus, the commutator is not zero. Right? I actually have to calculate that thing and show that, and get the value, but it doesn't matter that much for, for now. Right? What matters is that it's not zero, so within the light cone, I have these two measurements influencing each other. And, and, and so that what we see, is there's two important things here, right? First, this is what we expected under this new understanding of causality for a quantum field theory, right? Measurements of the field in different positions commute I mean, operators are calculated at different positions, commute with each other if they are outside the light cone of each other and does, do not commute if they are within the light cone of each other. Right? And this is, this is causality. The second thing is how the cancellation happened. Right? Uh, the cancellation happened uh, because you have this propagating, right? If I put right these as this transition we calculated at the start, right? This would be phi of y, phi of x, right? And the other one would be the opposite. Like there is an, something else going in the opposite direction in time and, and space, but, right? So, you have these two different propagators, let's call them propagators now, right? That conceal each other outside the light cone, which is uh, very interesting, right? 
remember that um, we have we have now antiparticles in this in these theories, and in the case of the scalar field, the antiparticle is the particle itself, right? So pretty soon we'll go back to this the complex field, and we'll see what happens. For now, what we're seeing is that for what matters to our theory, which is these commutators, there are two contributions. One that is going uh, forward in time, one that is going backwards or going forward with a negative frequency. Remember, you had these wave functions that you can look at the time, the signal, you can put the signal on time or, or put the same signal in energy, right? And these two these two contributions are concealing each other. So again, that fact that we have particles and antiparticles, or that the number of particles is not fixed in our theories, is working for us if we define things uh, um, if we define things in the right way. And causality is actually guaranteed by that. You cannot have that in in relativistic quantum mechanics, right? So that's new for quantum field theory. Now that we have seen the importance of these objects, which we call the Klein-Gordon propagators, let's spend some time uh, looking at their properties and how they relate um, to the Klein-Gordon equation, for instance. So the first thing I want to do here is write these in a more covariant uh, uh, way. Right? And I, I can do that just by looking at the second part here and, and, and doing a, a simple change, right? I, again, you realize that the time part of this exponential that is usually associated with the evolution from a point to another, right? has the wrong signal for either time or energy. There's no way around uh, that, right? So what I would do here is just take and, and make a small change that won't actually change the expression, but I just want to write it in a different way. So it is implied here that P0 is EP, right? And I'll just exchange that for an implied P0 equals to minus EP. Right? In order to not change the whole expression, I'm also doing this. So I take the three momenta and change the sign. That I can do because it's just a variable of integration, right? It, nothing will happen here because the signal that will come from three changes in three momenta here will be concealed by the three changes of the limits of integration. This guy does not change with three momenta, right? And, and in here I have a, a change of sign. And that means that when I change both time and space components of uh, p, then the exponential that is plus i p x minus y will go to exponential of minus i p x minus y, right? But then I have to write this whole expression, and I have to be careful with this part, right? If I'm changing the sign, I, I need to also be careful here, right? But I'm, for now, just changing what is the implied value of P0. So then I can write this like this. So D3P to the 2 pi cube. I'll bring this energy inside and 2EP exponential of minus i p x or minus y. So I'm doing this change only on the second integral here. So in here, I continue to have p0 equal e p. This signal, I'll, I'll bring down so I can write a sum here and have minus 2 e p here. I didn't do anything, right? This signal is just down here. And the exponential now is minus e p x minus y, but now p zero is minus e p. Right? Didn't do anything. I can go back to this expression. Just you see, I have the same thing. The only 
changes in the integration variable, right? But writing it like this uh, makes it um, very easy to see that I can write this as an uh, integral because I want uh, d4p over here, right? So I want also an integral dp0 to be here. And, and this is supposed to be the answer of that integral. I'm doing it backwards, right? I'm trying to get the integral that when, when I integrate in P0, this will be the answer. And writing it like this makes very clear that I can write this as an integral that goes around two poles, right? One pole where P0 is equal to EP and another pole where P0 is equal to minus EP, right? Because... The, if that works like that, then I can write, uh, if I can find an integral that has these two poles, I can write this integral in P0 as a, a integral that I do by residues and get this answer, right? I'm doing that backwards, right? So let's, for simplicity now, assume that x0 is bigger than y0. So that means both in, in this case where I'm doing these identifications, that means that time is flowing as it, sh as it should here, right? So the, there is this order in time. These exponentials are actually evolving in time as it sh they should. Of course, on the second one, uh, the energy is negative. It's the negative frequency uh, mode that we know it's there. Uh, the whole time, right? So I, what I'm getting in both uh, exponentials here is an evolution that is minus i p zero dx minus ty, right? The only strange thing is that on the second one p zero is negative, right? And, and in this one is exactly what we expect, right? So you have these two poles. With that in mind, I can write these. Um, this propagator as an integral so this is the propagator I can write at the d3p of 2 pi q over 2 pi cube and then the integral in dp0 and this is to take care of the factor that the fact the uh, factor that comes from the residues right of this function. Exponential of minus e p x minus y. Right? So now we have to check that if I do over a particular path, right, there is a path of integration that I have to be careful with here because I want to go around two poles to get this answer. Up here and the, of course this function must have these two poles in p0 so let's see if, if it, that that's working as intended right the first thing is, is to look for the poles right so this is just p0 square minus p vector square right minus m square equals zero that has two poles which are exactly right this is just minus e p square and that means that the poles are in p0 equal plus or minus e p as intended right so this this uh, this function actually has the two poles i need now i i need c1 to be a path that that goes around those poles right in in in, in order to 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 give me the answer I need, right? And this is also easy, right? So let me first draw the real P0 imaginary P0 planes. The poles are here oops, here and here, right, at plus EP and minus EP on the real axis. 
and the path of integration must go around these two poles, right? And then close somewhere. But you see, if you look at the the sign of this integral again, we we keep doing this again and again, right? What that term determines where should I close uh, this path of integration is the sign of the exponential, right? So it, right now I have this exponential up there, which goes the real part of this uh, uh, argument of the exponential is just the imaginary part of P0 times x0 minus y0. And, and here you see why I have to assume something, right? Because depending on the ordering of these two times, there's a sign here and, and that influences where I close this path of integration. So for that case, this is positive, and that means this guy must be negative and I must close um, down the path so that the the this uh, semicircle, let me draw it. This semicircle here, that does not look like a circle, is actually going to zero. That's guaranteed by this condition together with this one, right? And that means that up here, if I want to get the two poles and get that answer that I have with two poles, I have to put small circles around the poles and then I close the path of integration. I'm rotating on, in a way that I needed this minus sign here. Right? So that guarantees that this integral is actually that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going clockwise, so there's a sign. I have these two poles. Now it's just a matter of checking, right? We're writing these as a, in terms of the poles and going back. I'll leave that as, as an exercise. Mm -hmm. But it, but important to understand the logic here. I'm, I wrote this as a integration in four momentum now, right? But of a function that has appropriate poles to go back to the expression I had before. I'm doing integration in the back backwards, right? Um, now, what happens with the same integral, right? The same integral p0, if I take, uh, I mean, the same expression for y0 bigger than x0, right? In that case, as I said here, I'll be able to close this on the upper plane, right? On the upper plane. If I do that without um, changing the green line, right, we, we, without changing the path of integration here, then this, the whole integral will be zero because then I get no poles, right? So C1 implies that I'm going above both poles here. And I close whenever I, uh, I need according to this sign. Right? That means for y0 bigger than, than x0, right? keeping the prescription c1 that I go over the poles, this, this, this same integral will be 0. And that's, that prescription gives me what I call the retarded uh, propagator, which is usually called dr of x minus y. Right? which is defined as theta. This is the theta function, right? Is this a zero or one? Depending if this is positive or, or negative, right? So it ensures in this case that x zero is bigger than y zero. Otherwise, this, this whole, the whole propagator is zero, right? And this is the original expression that I had. And since I'm guaranteeing this, this condition, right, uh, then this is equal to d3p over 2 pi cube over 
d p zero two pi i c one. C one means this, right? It's the whole curve, but uh, uh, I'm guaranteeing that I go over the the poles. So this is a propagator that is only different from zero if I take x bigger than y, right? And that's why it's called retarded propagator. Right? Of course, I can simplify this expression a little bit, right? Again, c1 is implied, and, and I can write just retarded propagator is equal to d4p 2 pi 4 i p square minus m square exponential of i p x minus y and 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 this uh, the fact that it is zero where when uh, x zero is smaller than y zero is guaranteed by the path right which is always going above the poles right so this is the first kind of uh, klein gordo propagator hmm? uh, what ha what of course I, I won't do it here but of course i could do a c2 right i, I could just define a c2 that go under these two poles and then the whole story is reversed right then i can i can i can have only x0 smaller than y0 because the other way around that will that will be zero and that's what i call a advanced propagator when this time is bigger than this one right and I, i'll put that in the exercise for you to figure out right but uh it's, it's basically the same thing i just did now let's see how this this propagator relates to the klein gordon equation right? uh, and in order to do that it is easy easier to go to um, momentum space uh, so let's do a Fourier transform here if I take the r, the r of x minus y and write it like th this is already a Fourier transform right I can just identify actually what is the propagator in momentum space and, and baptize it as dr of p. It's just this part, right? This implies immediately that dr in momentum space is i p squared minus m squared for momentum space, right? We, we recall that the um, Klein-Gordon operator, the operator that appears in the Klein Gordon equation is just derivatives plus mass, right? Square, which I have been writing like this. And we did uh, a while ago uh, take this operator into momentum space, but only three momentum, right? If you recall and look a few lectures ago, we had. Uh, made the Fourier transform of this operator only on the three um, position and got an operator that was like that. We did this when we were figuring out the time evolution of the creation and annihilation operators. Right? So this is the Klein-Gordon operator in time slash momentum space. And of course, I can do the, the same with, with the time, right? I can do a Fourier transform of time into energy, right? That's, that's uh, quite easy to do. And the operator I get in that case, the Klein-Gordon operator in four momentum space is just P square minus M square. Right? So that means that if I, in momentum space, I act with the Klein-Gordon operator on the retarded propagator, I'll just get I, right? 
they have the same thing here which means that if I go back to position space so I do a Fourier transform here This will be, on this side, I just get the Dirac delta. Of x minus y. And on this side, I can bring the um, Klein-Gordon operator in front of this exponential, right? And this will be just p square minus m square multiplying this exponential. Which then I can use to exchange these powers in momentum by derivatives in x, for instance. Right? And, and, and of course, I have to be careful with this minus i's that come down, but it's easy to see that this is just del mu, del mu minus i squared acting on the same exponential. Right? I, I can just rewrite these as these derivatives acting here. And then if you compare uh, these two equations, now the Klein Gordon operator is not here. I have the exponential uh, and, 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 and the propagator. What I'm getting, right, because this, uh, now this can come outside of the integral and the whole integral that I, is left without this guy here is exactly the space, um, the, the propagator in, in, in position space, right? So what I'm getting is that and I have a sign here that I'll get rid of, plus m square acting on the retarded propagator is just, and this is the sign I, I, I brought it over here on the other side, right? And this is nice, right? This is important because that shows us that these uh, Klein, this retarded uh, Klein-Gordon propagator is a green function of the Klein-Gordon operator, right? So it's, it's the inverse of the operator, right? And, and now it's, it's very useful that we have done path integrals before getting here, because you remember in the case of the harmonic oscillator, these, these green functions are very important when you're quantizing the theory. The main point we got stuck on a lot with, with the harmonic oscillator was exactly trying to invert these operators, right? When you take the Gaussian part of, of the path integration and you want to do it, you have to invert operators just like this. The, this is exactly uh, the kind of operator that showed up. Of course, there we, we didn't have uh, for derivatives and all, but you see the logic. We have this operator. This is the quadratic part of the field in the Lagrangian, and you need to invert them. So now we have this commutator that arised when we, we stopped to think what causality means here, and at the same time, this 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 is the green function of the theory. Huh? So it, I hope it's becoming clear that uh, these, these, these objects are important, right? For the structure of the theory. We'll come back to that later and see uh, how important they are, but this is already a hint in that direction. The same is true for the advanced propagator. So if I follow the, the other prescription where I go below the poles, Instead of C1, I use some C2, 
and go below the poles, I'll get the advanced propagator. And the advanced propagator also satisfies the same equation, right? So it will be also uh, a green function for the Klein-Gordon operator. Before we finish, I just want to make one more definition and a few comments on the complex uh, scalar field. The definition I want to make is, is, is of the Feynman propagator. It won't be immediately obvious why this is useful, but we have everything we need to define it right now, so just do it and save it for later. Right? Uh, we'll, we'll later see uh, wh why this is actually an important thing. So take the um, um, uh, complex plane, plane of P0 that we just used uh, to define the Klein-Gordon propagators. Right? So this is the real part of P0, this is the imaginary part of P0, and we had poles um, on the real axis, right, at EP and minus EP. That's what happened when I wrote um, the Klein-Gordon propagator in terms of um, um, integral in four momentum. Now, suppose that instead of taking the path of integration that I took, that was either going above the two poles for the retarded propagator or going below the two poles for the advanced propagator, I take this path. So my path, I'll call this, say, C3. Now, I go below this pole and I go above that one. What? What happens? Right? This is just another path of integration that I could take. Right? Changing the path of integration completely changes, changes the object I'll get. So this is not the Klein-Gordon propagator anymore. Right? To see what I get here, I will exchange this uh, uh, prescription by a completely equivalent one, but which allows me to not uh, specify the path of integration, which is the following. Instead of going around the poles, I'll move the poles. So let me uh, take the path of integration out and I'll bring Now I can just go straight here, right? But I move the poles in this way. So I brought, since I was going under the pole on this side, right? I have to bring the pole up. So this is now at minus EP plus I epsilon. And here, since I went above the pole, I move the pole down into EP minus I epsilon. Epsilon is just a real positive number, right? That will make, I will make very small later to go back. Same thing I did with these circles, right? I have to make them really small in order to get the integral I wanted. But, but it should be clear that this prescription and this one are exactly the same in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, right? There was an implied Epsilon was the radius of this circle before, right? Was implied in the path of integration. And so this is a, com a completely equivalent. And I'll call the object that I get following that prescription, I'll call that the Feynman propagator, right? And now we, we take a look to see what's the relation of these uh, object with the ones we defined before. So this guy is just d4p over 2 by 4 i p square minus m square plus i epsilon exponential of minus i p x minus y. And, and this is the advantage 
of writing it like that because then I don't have to specify the path of integration. This is really the real axis for P0. This integral now is just from minus infinity to plus infinity in all four momenta, right? And, and instead of, I, I have this plus I epsilon here that takes care that the poles are actually in this position which is the same as this, but now I don't have to specify C3, I don't have to carry a C3 and say what it is. It's more elegant, right? And, and, and a way of writing it. The information is all in this plus I epsilon, right? In which you recognize the Feynman prescription that we used in, in harmonic oscillator. This is not by chance, and this hints at why this object will be important. But I will leave it at that for now. And and that's fine. Then one can show, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll give that as an exercise, that when I, I want to do the integral in P0, of course I have to close this to do, uh, to do um, residues, right? To do this integral by residues. And of course I'll close on the upper or lower plane, depending on, this, on the sign of the time part of this difference here, x0 minus y0. So it's just like in the retarded and advanced propagator, I, can, I have to close in the upper plane or the lower plane. But now, independently or on, on where I close, I always get one pole. I might get this pole, I might get that pole, but I'll get one of them. There's no way around it, right? So this will never be zero, but it will have two different answers, one from x0 bigger than y0 and another one for x0 smaller than uh, y0. And I'll have you guys show in the exercises that this means that this uh, Feynman propagator is actually written as this. which is just, right, uh, this, this piece right here, you recognize as this object I defined at the start, the x minus y, when we were first looking at causality, right? The object that I, I tried to, to use for causality and then later realized this is not a good one. And then This, which is the opposite, right? It's the same object, but for y x in here, y minus x. And so you see, when x zero is bigger than y zero, the Feynman propagator is this guy, and when y zero is bigger than x zero, it is uh, this guy. Mm -hmm. And and that means that I can write the Feynman propagator in terms of something that I call already. Uh, the time ordered product of these operators, right? So this is phi x, the time ordering of phi x, phi y vacuum. So this is another definition we use a lot for the Feynman propagator. Okay. So the one thing to notice about the Feynman propagator is that the Feynman propagator is not causal at all, right? Because we have proven that these objects are not zero when x is outside the light cone of y. It's not causal at all. So this cannot be directly related to observables. But it will be a very useful propagator. We use it a lot, right? And 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 our excuse for using it is that actually in this case the 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 Feynman propagator is more a correlation than a propagation of information. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll look into that um, more closely later, right? This, this is important. And also, and this is another thing that can be easily shown, 
if you go to momentum space and, and do the same the same thing we did with the retarded and advanced propagators you can show actually just apply this to this definition up here and you'll see that the Feynman propagator is also a green function of the klein gordon operator so again is another way of inverting that operator that I'll have to invert when I, I do this quantization by path integral, for instance. Right? And that means it's an important object in the, I mean, since quantizing through path integrals and canonical methods uh, is, are, is essentially the same, right? Uh, it will be important in both cases. Right? So for now, we just want to leave it at that. We will look way uh, deeper into the Feynman propagator when we get to the observables of the theory and how do you choose initial and final states and scatterings, right? We'll come back to this. Finally, the last uh, comment I want to make, totally unrelated with the Feynman propagator, is about the complex field. Because I, I, I went to the complex scalar field in order to introduce antiparticles, right? The reason I did that is because then uh, you see that this, the, there is this interplay between particles and antiparticles, and in the case of the real scalar field, they are the same, right? The, the, the particle and the antiparticle anti are the same, and, and there's a constellation between these positive and negative frequency modes in order to ensure causality. In the case of the, the complex field, this is even more uh, clear because as you remember, right, we had that phi, the, the field phi, always uh, decreases uh, charge, right? It either annihilates positive charge or creates negative charge, right? And the phi dagger is the opposite, right? It either annihilates negative charge or creates positive charge, right? In the case of the complex field, the object that will matter to us will be something like that, right? The commutator between phi and phi dagger y. This, this will be our um, client corner propagators for, for, for the field. Because, of course, if I, I don't have daggers here, these, these are all zero. Right? I need phi phi dagger. Right? And, and this is something that when I put into the vacuum here, right, will be proportional with all the, the other terms that I, I could have here to something like that. And actually, in this case, it's just equal. phi x, phi dagger y, minus phi dagger y, phi x, hmm? which, as you see, if this guy always increases charge, and, ha and here is, for the first time, I think, I'll start to use these pictorial descriptions of what's happening that eventually will become Feynman diagrams, right? It's basically always creating, increasing charge in Y, right? So I have positive charge flowing from Y to X where this field now acting on the state that I on the state that I produced here, right? This is another state. When this guy acts on that, it decreases charge back again. So if I start from zero, I finish at zero. And in here, the opposite is happening, right? I'm starting with nothing. I create negative charge. That is then, you go back to zero charge because this guy uh, increases it. So 
I, I went from 0 to minus 1, then plus 1, or minus plus 1, 0 again, right? And these two things is the same calculation as before. If, I, if you go back to the calculations I did for the real scalar field and carry this dagger carefully, you see that outside the light cone, these two things will conceal each other, but inside the light cone, they won't. So you see that really is because you have these particles and antiparticles in the theory that you maintain causality in the sense that I define for quantum field theories, in which what really matters is how a measurement in one point in space-time can influence another measurement in a different point in space-time, right? And, and uh, that works uh, quite nicely for, for um, complex fields that have a charge. And then you see that the antiparticles are playing a very important role and, 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 and also show the equivalence between uh, particles moving forward in time and antiparticles moving backwards in time in terms of how the time evolution uh, exponential looks like. So this, I think, is the message for the day. The next thing we'll do is uh, turn on interactions, right? So this is all done for the free field. And now I'll just make the potential in the Lagrangian different from zero. So interactions will start happening. And we want to see how that changes the affirmations we made and what kind of um, what kind of um, uh, consequence that has. But before I get to the interactions, I'll make a little detour in the usual formal way the course has been following and define uh, the observables. This will be a bit of a leap. We'll have to take some things for granted so that we can define observables. And then we'll go back to these formal way of, of doing. So next uh, lecture we'll talk about the S matrix and scattering in quantum field theory. See you then.